So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our wonderful guest host today, Stacy Flores, who has over 10 years of experience working in education in high schools to colleges and universities. She's worked with students and athletes to keep them prepared for their transition, both academically and professionally. And she is currently pursuing her PhD in sociology at Arizona State University. So now, Stacy, I'm going to turn it over to you to get started with the show. Thank you, Kendall, and welcome, everybody. I am very happy to be here with our distinguished guests. We're going to go ahead and we're going to start the segment. And I want to start with you, Dr. Roche. Um, you were a key part of the Stanford and Strava study, which looked at the impacts of COVID-19 on professional athletes. Um, the study looked at 131 professional athletes. Can you give us a sense of who the participants were, please? Absolutely. So these were U.S. professional athletes, um, and they're on the Strava platform. And so the, the way that we obtained those athletes was we emailed pro badge athletes. And so those are professional athletes, um, primarily endurance athletes as well. So 44% runner, 39% cyclist, 11% uh, triathlete, and then 6% other. Um, and these are also athletes who are primarily making money through sport. And can you tell us a little bit about what you found as a result of the study? We had some very interesting findings. Um, so overall, we looked at fitness levels, perception of fitness during COVID-19. We looked at motivation and we looked at mental health. I would say for me, the most interesting findings were the mental health findings. Um, so we actually found that compared to pre-COVID, we saw a 5.8 times increase in the number of athletes who reported feeling down or depressed during COVID. Um, and to me, you know, I do a lot of research and that number was pretty staggering compared to other numbers that I've seen doing research. Um, and then as a result of that, we actually found that one in five athletes reported difficulty exercising as a result of COVID. Um, and so we're seeing that some of these mental health effects are transitioning into sport. Um, and then the final point that I thought was interesting was that um, classically, we think of, classically, we think about exercise as a therapy for athletes or exercise as something that's helpful for mental health. But interestingly, we found that athletes were actually spending increased time exercising during COVID-19, yet we were still seeing these large increases in the mental health struggles. So I was listening to another podcast that you did, and you mentioned how you followed up um, the survey with some qualitative results. Can you talk a little bit about what you found when speaking with the athletes a little bit further? Absolutely. So as a result of these findings that we found, we realized that we really needed to talk to athletes because these results were staggering. And we felt like athletes were each having individual circumstances that may cause some of these changes. Um, and so what we found were that athletes were struggling financially. So many athletes reported that because they were deriving their like finances from sport, going through these struggles made them think about their financial future. And that was something that was challenging to them. Another interesting thing, thing that we found was changes in motivation. So athletes feeling like it was hard to get out the door to go for runs. Um, athletes feeling like um, struggling with uncertainty, thinking about racing or competition changes. Um, and I think that uncertainty was kind of a common thread that was linking many of these qualitative interviews that we did. So the study also mentioned perseverance. Can you tell us about how that was measured? Yes, so we didn't measure that directly. I think perseverance is one of those things that's extremely hard to measure in a survey design and even hard to measure when talking to people. I think everyone's baseline is different. Um, if we had a way to measure that, that would be amazing for sports psychology in general. Um, but I think from talking to the athletes, I realized that athletes were deriving unique experiences from this and really drawing energy from the fact that if they can go, go through something like this, it should make future um, situations like injury or competition struggles or lack of performance um, motivation easier in the future, knowing that they persevered through this time, which is so challenging for so many athletes. So Michael Phelps has really been a catalyst pre-COVID, right, of talking mm -hmm. about mental health. Um, since the pandemic has, uh, you know, impacted every person worldwide, do you think that that has also had a significant um, willingness for athletes um, to share their struggle with mental health? I think for sure. So I think social media is playing a big role in this and a great role. I think 
the more that we can have these open conversations with athletes about struggles that everyone is going through, it creates this normalization process where athletes feel like they're not the only one that's struggling. And I think that's something that's very, very important. The other thing that I think is important too is, is that athletes often use sport as a way to um, you know, further their motivation or to, to kind of like work through some of these feelings. And I think it's really important that athletes realize there's other resources out there. So for example, therapists or coaches or people that they can work with that they can talk through some of these different issues. Thank you, Dr. Roche. I wanna bring in Rebecca into the conversation. And Rebecca, I actually wanna start with that same question I asked uh, Dr. Roche um, regarding you know, athletes' willingness to discuss uh, mental health in this time of COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's incredibly important. I think something in the Strava study that resonated with me so much was that one in five athletes was dealing with kind of mental health and motivation related issues. Uh, that was me. <laughs> that was a lot of my teammates. Um, and I think, yeah, the social media platforms have been so important because you're able to connect with people. You're not seeing them in person. Um, you're not going to track meets and, and talking to other athletes. Um, and so you're able to kind of feel like, you know, you're part of this greater community that's also dealing with the same issues, um, which has definitely um, helped me to feel like it's, it's a normal feeling um, dealing with these mental health related struggles to, to COVID. And you started to touch on this, but I want to ask you to go a little bit further. So COVID-19 has really disrupted the normalcy mm -hmm. cancellations of competitions. We've seen start and stop returns. What was your personal experience through this past year? Yeah, gosh, it uh, feels like it's been years now, <laughs> not just months. Um, but back in March, our team, um, I run with a professional women's team in Bend, Oregon. Um, we were training for the Olympic trials, which were supposed to be in June. Um, those are the qualification uh, to make the Olympic team, which was to be in Tokyo. Um, and so we were at training camp. We we're based in Bend, Oregon. We were down in Flagstaff, Arizona, actually. And as we were down there, we kind of thought at first, like maybe the first few meets of the season won't happen, like stuff in April, we're kind of under a two week quarantine. And then it became very, very clear that track season had just all the meets had completely fallen off the calendar. Um, the Olympics were postponed and therefore the Olympic trials were postponed. Um, and it became increasingly clear that all of this kind of work we'd put in for the year was probably not going to come to fruition. Um, you know, we were lucky later in the summer, um, Portland track, um, and sound running a couple organizations on the West coast, put together some really small scale meets with really, really tough restrictions, like tons of COVID testing, temperature checks, masks up until you race. Um, but so we were lucky to have some competitions, but given the fact that it was supposed to be an Olympic year, which has you know, so much pomp and circumstance. It was definitely a, definitely a shift. And even now we're like, you know, we've come off the track season. We're kind of thinking about and getting ready for what's now going to be the Olympics in 2021. And still we're facing, you know, gyms are closed. Um, we can't cross train in normal facilities and, you know, we're making, you know, doing our best to run and find tracks, but even still a lot of those are closed. So we're figuring it out. So let me ask you another question. When you first realized that, you know, you're, you were directly being impacted with your sport as a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. athletes were across. Did you give your time, give yourself time to mourn that loss? And mm -hmm. what did that look like for athletes? Yeah, it looked really different depending on who you were. Um, for me personally, as I said, we were in that flag staff for training camp and I just needed to take a step back from trying to like run the hard workouts and put in the like extreme intensity um, in order to kind of like get over the fact that like all the things I'd hoped for, trained for, go, I went to bed thinking about every night um, were now kind of out the window. So I just tried to run for mental health <laughs> just because I enjoyed it for a couple of weeks. And then for a few weeks after that, I was kind of going through the motions and just trying to train. We put some uh, time trials, which are basically inter-team races on the calendar. And I actually started talking to a psychologist, which was incredibly helpful, um, helped me kind of work through those feelings. And eventually when, when racing came back in, in a small way, um, end of July and August, I felt a little bit more, more motivated and ready, but had to give myself the time to recover and be okay. So I know that during this time, you actually kind of shifted and focused a lot of your extra time that you had in politics. Can you describe how that transition was and how that helped you during this time? Mm -hmm. Totally. So um, a couple of years ago when I moved to Bend, um, I've always been an athlete that likes to have 
something, something significant to do outside of just, you know, the running and the training. Um, so I worked on a campaign for a local candidate running for mayor two years ago, ended up working for her as she became mayor the last two years. Um, and her former campaign manager, um, who runs a political consultancy at the end of May called me up, um, and asked if I'd like to be a campaign manager, which normally in 2020, a year that was supposed to be the big Olympic trials year, um, tons of competitions was going to, you know, race in Europe and across the world. Well, that was no longer happening. Um, so I kind of took it as a silver lining to be able to like re-involve myself in a campaign and, um, and like local politics in the community I care so much about. So that was a lot of fun. It was a little crazy. <laughs> I was happy for it to be over a couple of weeks ago, but um, I learned a lot and uh, was able to kind of take advantage of something professionally outside of running, you know, because, because running was put on the back burner due to COVID. And now I want to shift a little bit to Dr. Pickup. Um, Dr. Pickup, um, the British are kind of known for that mentality of having this stiffer upper lip, right? So has this pandemic shifted the perception of emotion and mental health? Wow, that's a question I wasn't expecting, Stacey, around the stiff upper lip. And actually, I think it's probably a, a misnomer now, and it's quite an old fashioned view of, of, of us over here, in certainly in London. And I think like other um, panelists here have commented, we've certainly seen more, um, more people and more athletes as people talking about, about their feelings. And that, that's a really good thing. And I think there was an acknowledgement through sport that, well, first of all, there's that tension, isn't there? You know, sport being a good thing, good for me, good for you, good for us all to be physically active. And it's gonna make us feel better, right? But of course, when we're talking about athletes and athletes striving and becoming to be performers, to be the best versions of themselves, that in itself is a real journey of transformation. And so I think here in, in the UK, sport by sport, we can see a different landscape. So some sports have put an awful lot of effort and support into, um, into th this part of um, athletic support. Um, and other sports perhaps still have that kind of macho work through the pain, it's, it's, it's good for you, it's character building. And some of that still very much relates to some of our you know, more combative field sports. For example, boxing, um, my own sport of, of, of rugby and, and, and playing rugby is still very much you know, a difficult space in which to express feelings and express anxieties around one's own journey. So I think it's a, a mixed picture. Uh, and of course, at this time of you know, where athletes are used to having routines and used to having that support around them and, and support structure, be it a, a good person who's making you a cup of tea or be it the psychologist, there's often in the sporting setting, people around you, people to talk to. But of course, the impact of COVID, the first, our first lockdown in the UK, very quickly took all of that away. And, and my particular concern working in, in higher education, but also with, with young people in that that the learning journey um, in what leads towards college and university is that feeling of, 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 of being lost. And, and, and where do I go when, when that bit of my routine is taken away? Um, and I would say as well, a real concern for us all has to be that when we think about talent and we think about who is getting that support, of course, the notion of talent itself, who gets to be in the squad, who's part of that roster that's seen as the elite team, you know, is of course subject to a, a range of social influencing factors. So it's racialized, it's around social class, um, there's the impact of gender, and of course, potentially those for whom sport can be the most powerful vehicle of development um, are those that aren't in those systems now where that support is available. So you mentioned your first lockdown, and I know you're heading into a second. Um, in yeah. So what are the concerns now for the athletes as you're in the second lockdown? And what kind of precautions are being taken? Hmm. So our second lockdown, which, which we hope will end in time for, for Christmas, for the, for, the, for the winter holidays, is, is a bit different. 
So in the first lockdown back in March, we, we, we pretty much closed everything. And, you know, schools, for example, closed and the kids were being schooled through, through Zoom, through Teams, from a home environment. At the version we're in now, children, young people are back in school. Universities are open um, with different tiers of restriction as to how we go about our work. But you know, so the vehicle for that, the outlet for sport is now in the, the educational setting. You know, most community organisations that run sport, that run by volunteer coaches and parents, all of that's now not happening. So when the kids are in school, that's where the focus on that support needs to be. And the really hard thing, really hard thing is, you know, and I've got two teenage um, pickups with, with me here, and, and that, that they play sport and they're in squads and they're in clubs and they've just got going again. The first lockdown had ended and the, the, the tangible sense of, of joy and fun and that social engagement, we could see that watching from the sidelines. And now all of that has stopped again. So we're back to Zoom fitness sessions and, and coaches being innovative for sure, um, work, working in, in different ways. But, but a concern over that two steps forward, one step back kind of feeling um, and, and aim towards that, what we hope is the light on the hill coming, coming quickly for, for us to return back to something more like normal um, in a consistent way. So you mentioned the role of coaches adapting to these changes and being innovated. What other ways have you seen the community uh, cope uh, to help the athletes, to help um, students or individuals during this time, because a loss of sports impacts a community and the athletes at all varying levels. No, 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 definitely. And I think certainly over here, every different sport has had a range of um, sort of structures put in place. Every sporting national body, um, you know, whether it's the Football Association or um, the National Basketball um, federation, as it were, not the NBA, of course, but, but so, so every sport has, has got its own approaches. Um, and so um, athletes go into their sessions in a COVID secure way with, with you know, spraying of equipment, you know, socially distanced drills and activities. Um, the athletes been in, in performance bubbles so they can, you know, with their coach, you know, not be you know, en masse in, in the usual way. Um, fixtures were starting to happen, competitions were starting to happen, and, and, a, and that, was, that was done with, with an awful lot of effort from volunteers, from the coaches themselves, to, to, to get things um, going, going again. So, so that, that's all been really, really positive and really powerful. But I think there's an awful long way to go in, in most sort of grassroots level sports, at least. So for the majority of, of our athletes, um, who are not in that elite band, you know, there's an awful long way to go to think further. Beyond that, the physical bit, how I organise my drills as a coach and how I make sure people are socially distanced and I'm spraying the, the equipment afterwards or between sessions, to think more broadly about how we enable those, the sort of social dimension, the, the effective development and that psychological um, space for, for the athletes to talk and to find time to do that. Um, in person, so it's not all on on a screen. And I think, you know, I don't know about you all, but I'm, you know, so looking forward to the day to meet real people again and to have that that human interaction. And I think there will be a premium on that. And as I said, when when we came out of our first lockdown, seeing just just the fun and the enjoyment that people were having through sport um, again, having you know been deprived of that for for a period of time, was really really powerful to see. I think if I just reiterate an earlier point again about the disadvantages and you know, this, this is absolutely not a level playing field. So those that will get the most innovation, those that will get the most support for us will be those already in what we might term as elite. And you know, that means that very many um, future talented athletes who are on that earlier journey you know, are missing out on a big chunk of support. And those innovations, I think what we need to be thinking about is how any innovations, particularly now, you know, help to redress that imbalance. And, and the notion of you know, levelling the playing field um, needs to ensure that grassroots sport, as well as the elite sport, sees innovation and sees 
um, different ways of supporting our, our young people. I want to ask one final question for all three panelists in this segment. What is the role sports plays in being able to manage challenges such as we are in today? I love that question. So I think for me, sports is essentially just dealing with a bunch of variables that can go wrong. And I think it teaches athletes over time how to work through those variables. It gives athletes, as soon as you like manage one of those variables in competition, or as soon as you get through injury, or as soon as you, you show up to competition and have a good day, it gives you that confidence that you need to keep shooting your shot, to keep taking these risks. Because like, in order to manage those variables, you actually do need to take risks as an athlete. And I think that's something that athletes can learn over time, the more they do it. And it's something that becomes empowering over time time quite as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what Dr. Roche is saying. I mean, athletics is in itself a series of challenges, um, no matter what age you are. I mean, learning a new skill, um, something I've dealt with a lot, resilience and kind of coming back from injury. Um, I think competition, I think competition this year um, and training in general has been a challenge in itself that will help athletes over time, um, how to navigate training without a gym, um, how to navigate, um, you know, training without a team. Um, I think all of that, like, you know, like builds character over time and also allows you hopefully for me to help with challenges I'll have down the line um, because I was able to come back from uh, and deal with you know various challenges this year. Again great question so, so for me it's um, I really like the word you've used in some of the material around this this session and the word is liminality so the notion of being in, in a state of liminality between place you know, and, and sometimes athletes and indeed, you know, students in education, when, when we speak to them, think about that as, you know, starting something new. It's that challenge of, it might feel daunting, it's sort of stepping off a cliff into the unknown or what, waiting to, to blossom into something I don't know what it's going to be like yet. And actually being in that process and in some sports on a weekly basis, it's a constant back and forth challenging um, situation. Um, going through that certainly um, equips equips the athletes with, with it's probably an overused word, but a degree of resilience, um, but, but really a, an understanding of self, an understanding of self within a challenging context by definition. And, you know, understanding of self is really important, of course, in all sorts of ways, not least beyond, beyond the sports field, beyond the, the track, beyond the arena, when, when that whistle stops. And for us all, it will. And, and, and actually having all of those experiences to have been through, you know, the majority of which might be deemed as failure, you know, and, 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 and actually understanding what that means and feels like is a really powerful um, space and a really powerful vehicle for that personal development. I want to thank you all. We are ending our first session. Um, Dr. Roche, you're going to stay with me. Dr. Pickup and Rebecca, we will see you toward the end. And I want to pass it over now to my colleague, Kendall, who will lead us through a poll at this time. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I just want to quickly make a comment that it's, you know, I love what Dr. Pickup was talking about, how this is, it, sport is not an even playing field. And I can't wait for segment three, where we kind of dig in a bit more into you know what are these innovations how do we really need to rethink about our approach to to sports to athletes um to to really redefining mental health overall and so we we kind of broached this subject around um you know how are how is mental health changing how is coming forward how is talking about it changing um is it changing and uh and obviously surprising Dr. Pickup a little bit with, with sort of an old uh, adage, an old term of, of that's not really how we are anymore, which is wonderful to see the evolution. So I'm going to launch this poll and I'm going to read the question here, um, as well as the answers for, for everybody and our panelists are welcome to join in too. Um, but thinking about this, this stigma uh, around speaking about mental health, do we feel uh, the stigma is increasing? Is it decreasing um, within the world of sports? So go ahead and, and take a moment to answer that, um, whether it's increasing, decreasing, no change. Um, depends on who in sport is speaking about mental health. Um, I think that that's kind of an interesting, who who gives the allowance uh, and, and who has to, to kind of shy away 
um, or, or maybe we're not sure. So take a moment to answer that. And I just wanted to make a note too, uh, please, if you have any questions or comments, um, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. You just open that right up. Our panelists, uh, as well as our hosts, are keeping an eye on that box there. Thank you so much, Thomas. I see that you absolutely have a question, which is wonderful. Um, and so we'll be, we'll be monitoring that and answering those questions um, throughout as we can get to them. So, all right, we'll give everybody just a couple more seconds here to get their votes in. Go ahead and end this poll. All right, let's see these results. All right, this is good news. We are seeing, we are feeling that there is a decrease in the stigma around mental health and sports. So, um, and, I, and I see that some folks do, do think that it depends on, on who in sport is speaking about that. So that would be an interesting question to explore, but I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Stacy, to get going with segment two. Thank you, Kendall. I want to welcome back Dr. Roche and bring in Dr. Cargill to our conversation. Thank you again for being with us today. Uh, Dr. Cargill, I want to start with you um, as we're currently in the NFL season and other professional sports return before the NFL did. Were there insights that you observed um, during that time that helped inform your work? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the things, sorry, I just froze up for a little bit. Hopefully you can, you can see and hear me. Um, one of the things that I think we were really paying attention to was in, in my world as the director of player wellness was just how players were responding to the different protocols in place for, for COVID, uh, particularly how they were respond, how their families were responding. You know, we, the NFL and, and NFLPA agreed not to go into a bubble format. We just have too many guys um, and too many coaches to be able to pull that off. And so we were really looking for how folks were coping with the protocols. We were very worried about just the, the idea of testing and the, the toll it takes to have to do that and fears that we have about sticking things up our noses. And, you know, we were just paying attention to, to what, and we learned a lot of good lessons. And I think, I think you've been able to see that we've been able to pull it off at least through, through these weeks. Um, you know, we've been able to, to, to get all of our games in. So I want to ask uh, another question more about pain and pain management, right? So football is a very high contact sport and you couple this with short or no preseason um, and the COVID restrictions. So we're seeing an increase of reports of increased injury during this year. During this year. Has that impacted pain management for athletes? Well, you know, I think this is a great question. It's something that we, you know, particularly in my in my world, we are always focused on the health and safety of the players. And so, you know, pain management is something that, you know, I, I co-chair a committee um, for the NFLPA with about pain management, and we are consistently focused on it. In terms of changing anything, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's changed anything. We are, you know, I think the change is always happening. We follow the science wherever it takes us and, and nowhere it doesn't. Um, and so I think that's, I think that in terms of what pain management has meant to us, we're just, we're wanting to make sure that our field conditions are safe, that, you know, when, when we sort of came back to training camp, there were stipulations in the CBA around the warm up period and making sure that we gave folks enough time to kind of get their bodies reacclimated to having all that time off. Uh, Cause we know from, from previous years when we had lockouts uh, in 2011, that we did also see an increase in soft tissue injuries. And so we were making sure that we were paying close attention to that. And that was something that from the player standpoint that we were gonna advocate for in terms of our health and safety. And when we look at chronic pain, it's something that athletes are familiar with. It can disrupt sleep, eating habits, cause stress and affect uh, mental health. So how is the NFLPA helping athletes to manage? So that, that's a great question. <clears throat> you know, I think one of the things that we do, obviously it starts with education. Uh, you know, we, we know that our, our guys uh, and, and their families are well aware of the toll that football takes on their bodies. And, you know, the, the first line of, line of defense is making sure that we have an educated uh, population in terms of what works in terms of pain management. Um, and, 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 in, and certainly that we have the resources at their disposal to be able to offer in, in the event that they, that they want or need support. Um, and so it is as far as, you know, the, the differences in pain management goes, you know, again, like I said, we are constantly thinking about the ways in which 
science is evolving. Um, you know, I know sort of we're going we're getting to the point of you know the the changes in marijuana and and all of that. You know, and and I think that we will follow the science wherever it takes us. And I think that's that's certainly something that I I feel confident in in being able to say publicly. Well, you led right into the next question that I was going to ask was around the loosening of marijuana use. Um, and I know you said you're going to follow the sciences, uh, follow the science of where that's going to take you. When you do this, is it going to be with consulting other professional sports as well? Like how will the NFL Players Association look at what that looks like now that five additional states have loosened the restrictions around marijuana? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we are in constant contact with, you know, the experts in the field and our colleagues and counterparts in other leagues. So that that goes without saying. Where we are right now in terms of the NFL and the NFLPA is that, you know, marijuana is still a banned substance for us. Um, and it will continue to be until such time that folks decide that it's it's an acceptable uh, it's an acceptable tool in, in the pain management um, or other sort of management um, toolkit. So at, at this point, you know, I think what we want to do is be very clear and diligent in terms of how we pursue the science, you know, whether we want to be involved in research studies is something that is still a question that we, we certainly will ask. We haven't, we haven't decided one way or the other, but we certainly know that with our platform, we can certainly use that in order to sort of advance any science that, that's out there. Uh, but what, you know, I think what, what is important to remember is that right now the science doesn't give us enough information to make these decisions for our league. Uh, and so the important message is for our players is that they, they, can't, they can't smoke if they're playing. Um, and so, because it will land them in, into a bunch of trouble if, if they do. Uh, but we, you know, we're, we're well aware of the times that we're in. And we know that, you know, folks make decisions um, within the bounds of the laws of their state wherever wherever they are um, and that we what we want to do is make sure that folks are being safe and that they're educated around what the implications of that is. So some of the pro sports chose not to have or prohibit fans. Um, the NFL has limited in person uh, fans. How do you feel that that impacts team motivation. Well, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, that that's a that's a good question, but it's, it's a hard one to answer right because I think what we our balancing is, you know, our players are guys who are, you know, intelligent and, and smart and really well informed and understand their game very well, right? And so some of them are very excited to have fans back in the stands because it makes it feel like normal, right? And I think what we want to do, we know in 2020 has been so abnormal that anything that sort of represents what normalcy, I think we, we certainly want to advocate for. We also have to balance that with our guys who are very worried about COVID-19 and the spread. And I think, you know, as the season has, as, as training camp started, as the season progressed, you know, th them feeling more comfortable with the high level of protocols in place and, and being able to keep the vast majority of our guys COVID free, that has abated somewhat, but I, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to overlook those guys who also are like, hey, like this is still a dangerous situation that we're in, and some of them may prefer not to have fans in the stands, even though they, they know that it represents a, a sign of, of normalcy and may sort of aid in their ability to kind of get up for a game. Um, so I, I think, you know, what, what we at the Players Association have to do is represent all 2,000 players, and you know, we, we can't, we, we, I'm not gonna say we don't care about the fans. Of course we do. We represent the players, um, and 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 in two thousand players are a wide range of feelings and sentiments about all of this. So this is why this has been so complex for us. But we try to sort of reach an understanding and consensus with our guys. Thank you for your uh, answer. I think that that's very good because I know that everybody is on a different level and different scale of comfort. Um, and I want to ask you, uh, Dr. Roche, uh, a question regarding how pain management may differ in athletes that are, you know, endurance athletes versus high contact sports? That's a great question. Um, I think, well, I think this is a very interesting conversation to start because I think physical pain is inextricably linked to mental pain. And I think there's an interesting like feedback loop between the two of those. And so I think like right now, this is an even more important conversation to talk about pain management, just because athletes who are in mental pain may actually be experiencing more physical pain. I think for endurance athletes, the pain is interesting. So I think it's less about like, walking onto a football field and having a chronic ankle issue. Um, it's about, you know, 
developing this pain tolerance over time. So I work with athletes who run 100 mile races and they're certainly experiencing a world of pain throughout that 100 miles, um, whether it's you know cardiovascular pain, their breathing is really hard, um, whether their full body is starting to hurt. And that's very different than like the short intense pain that football players, basketball players go through. Um, and I think it requires different pain management strategies. So I think um, you know while they're similar, I think there's a very different um, approach to like the chronicity of the, the pain that endurance athletes are feeling versus um, the pain that may occur from injuries or from performance um, in athletes like in athletes playing basketball or football, et cetera. And so I want to open up the next few questions to both of you, um, Dr. Carville and Dr. Roche. So has there been a shift that you have seen in the athlete mindset of, you know, toughen up, take it, play through the pain when it comes to pain? I think personally, so I coach a number of athletes. I think there has been, and I think there's been a shift. I think like for a long time, there've been these quotes, you see them like famously on locker room walls, like, you know, suffering is, in, is inevitable, pain is temporary. And I think like pain sometimes is glorified in a way that is not healthy for athletes. Um, and I think I've seen a transition to emphasizing that like, you know, going through physical pain, like for endurance athletes, like sometimes it's a good thing, but I think it's, I think athletes are starting to recognize the boundaries between what is good pain and what is bad pain and that not all pain. Cause I think like some athletes are wired to think like, oh, all pain is good pain. And I think there's like that trend to recognize that a little bit more. Yeah, I, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting question. Cause I, you know, and as, as I was thinking about a response I was thinking about, you know the two different levels that we can take this question. Uh, culturally, football and, and their sort of views toward pain and pain management, I think, is in one place. But with an educated population, an educated populace, we, we know that individuals may be in a different place than that. And so, I, so on the first level, you know, the culturally football, you, you certainly do tough it, tough it out. You certainly do play through your pain. Um, and I think the, the mindset is that, you know, there, there's, the football is a hundred percent injury sport. And so it's going to happen. And so you sort of make a calculation, is this pain, you know, enough for me to not play, or is it, is it enough for me to, to sort of push through? Um, and I think that is, that is certainly, you know, for better or worse, reinforced uh, at, at all levels through, throughout the sport with an educated population and sort of understanding with what we've been able to do in terms of pain management, you do have individual guys who, who, are, who are better at advocating for themselves when, when they do have pain and sort of know what feels right in order to do in terms of pursuing a therapeutic or what doesn't feel right. And so I think you, you may sort of see clashes between that, you know, or, you know, I think this is when you kind of hear about the stories about people who think somebody's ready to come back and the player is saying that they're not ready to come back. So, you know, I, I think the, the two are not necessarily, I don't want to say on the same page. Uh, I think the interests at times conflict a little bit. And so as far as the Players Association is concerned, what we want to do is make sure that we are holding everyone accountable for making sure that our players are taken care of. And at the same time, making sure that our players are, are, are very much sort of informed and empowered to make these decisions for themselves. So has there been an increase in the amount of athletes seeking support for mental health during this year? Or even when you look pre and post, what have you seen? So I, so I will say, I think the trend is, I think we're continuing on an upward trend. Uh, you know, mental health over the last few years has, is becoming less and less stigmatized. We, we know that to be true. Uh, and, and particularly in our sport, you know, we, we, in our sort of collective bargaining process in 2019, we established what I think is the only um, agreement of its sort in the country between the players association and the league to have mandated mental health treatment. Um, and so it's, it's in the CBA, so it's not going anywhere, at least for another 10 years, that every club has a clinician on staff for a designated number of hours. And this is an agreement between us. We, you know, I co-chair a, a, a behavioral health committee with my counterpart at the league. And so it's very much entrenched. And I say that to say that I think that's an outgrowth of just the, the trend that we're seeing, right? And, and so, 
you know, our players are coming from, you know, many, many schools, power five conferences, most of them have a psychologist or a mental health clinician in the athletic department. So getting mental health treatment is becoming just a part of their fabric of being an athlete. And I think that certainly these guys then get drafted or coming to the league. And then when they see the clinician on staff, it's, it's becoming sort of second nature that this person is going to be there and that they're there to help me. So I'm, so I'm gonna sort of couch that as saying, like, I think we're already on an upward trajectory. What I think has happened though, is I think that particularly early on in the, in the pandemic, um, you know, we were sort of seeing an uptick uh, just around the time when they were supposed to be back in, in off season training activities, you know, that, and they weren't able to, and we were all kind of in that, what is going on phase, you know, back in April, where none of us really understood what was happening uh, and the implications there. And I think we did certainly see, I certain I know that I got a lot of requests for, for counseling um, and just wanting to be preemptive, both for themselves, for their spouses, for their children. Um, and so I want to be clear that I think our guys are very thoughtful about the impact that all this had on had on everybody. Um, and so we certainly did. But you know, as as training camp got started, they got back in their groove, and you know, they started accessing the resources that they have. But one thing that I do know is that, you know, in, in terms of having a, a clinician on staff at every club, you know, they certainly are seeing guys and they're engaging more actively and proactively, I should say in these conversations. And so mental health work is happening, I think at a higher clip because COVID has happened, whether that's seeking individual therapy or whether that's just sort of making that, that clubs have made much more space for clinicians in the light of COVID, but also in the light of the racial injustice that's happened. There's been a lot more energy and effort toward focusing on the mental health of, of our players uh, via the clinicians in, in house in the clubs. I 100% agree with that. And real quick, I would just love to add. So I think I work with an, uh, athletes across socioeconomic spectrums um, in different cultures. And I have definitely seen the stigma reduced in terms of seeking mental health treatment. The one challenge that I've seen though is access. Um, so I've seen right now, psychologists are totally overwhelmed during COVID. Um, I've seen that individuals are struggling to pay for therapy sessions, struggling to get this access. And that's something that I think I've made a personal mission after seeing the results from the Strava study of increasing, decreasing barriers to that access and figuring out how we can make psychologists, therapists more accessible across socioeconomic statuses, across cultures, um, and even to like non-elite athletes as well. I wanna thank you both as we end this second segment. I want to ask uh, Dr. Pickup and Rebecca to please rejoin us for our final conversation about liminality in sport. Dr. Pickup, I want to start with you and I wanna really talk to you a little bit more about the role of sport and education. Um, you talked a little bit about earlier in the first segment about the innovations that have taken place. And I want to really ask um, about younger athletes, uh, athletes that are in the high school level, specifically in the US how do we prepare them and support them during this time periods of liminality? Um, especially as you mentioned, um, Dr. Roche um, is about really around the access to funding, uh, the mental health support is greatly different at the lower levels, or even as you mentioned, Dr. Pickup, the grassroots levels than it is for professional athletes. Thank you, Stacey. So I guess for me, the connection between grassroots community sport, where young people are playing, either in schools or in community clubs for us, you know, and the cross section of the crossover from that into the notion of being identified as being talented or showing potential, there's a gap. And there's a gap where young people might be regularly demonstrating that potential, but it's never spotted, it's never seen because, because of their own situation, their own circumstances, they're not maybe not in the right school or they haven't got the right coach that's networked in into the next level. And I think, you know, whether or not we're talking about the present impact of COVID, those those inequalities of opportunity have to be tackled through through the sport organizations themselves, but but through work with educational partners. Because of course education, whichever um, side of the Atlantic you're on, you know, good education is about scaffolding, it's about supporting, it's about nurturing, 
It's about enabling young people to be the best versions of themselves. So sport is no different. And, and sport, I think, has a long way to go, particularly now. But maybe now is the opportunity for accelerating those ways of, of thinking about, perhaps thinking about coaching differently at an individual coach level and what that means. Do we mean coaching? Do we mean mentoring? Do we mean guiding, advising? And of course, the best, the best coaches that we've all worked with will be all of those things and, and more. So, so how, in terms of coach education, what is it? What do we do that's different, that helps, helps all of our volunteers and, and paid staff step up into that broader view? So it's not just about the technical skill development or the physiological development. It's about that human development of the athlete-centered approach. And I think in education, we have more of a captive audience, don't we? You know, young people on the whole have to be in school and, and many go to college and, 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 and the massification of higher education worldwide is part of that opportunity. More people getting into, into higher education, which is fabulous. But that means we also have to make sure that the resources and the opportunities and the approaches that we take in, in the elite strata of sport and of education are also turned so that the focus, the attention, the resource, the energy, the ideas, the innovation is also turned to face those for whom other people so far haven't been looking for. I wanna ask uh, Dr. Roche and Rebecca uh, this question as well, uh, both as athletes and then as um, you know coaches, you know, because I know you coach Dr. Roche as well. Um, and it's following up on what Dr. Pickup just said. What do you feel are skills that coaches need to support athletes in periods of liminality? I love this point. So I think for me, I think coaches need to be really good about talent identification and then communicating that talent to athletes. So I think like for me, when I think about talent, talent isn't just these like obvious things that we see on the surface that we call talent traditionally in athletics. So like for runners, it's not just like VO2 max. It goes beyond that. It's like grit, it's work, work ethic. It's like ability to respond to these challenges. And I think like communicating that to athletes is not only motivating, but it also allows them to see themselves as like this unique individual that isn't just numbers that, you know, it's, it's this, this entire being of an athlete that actually is talent. And I think having these very open conversations with athletes about talent and the fact that they are talented just in very, very unique ways specific to each individual, I think is something that's both motivating and inspiring, but also great during challenging times like this. Yeah, I would agree. I think that I, I think a lot about kind of the mental health side. Um, like as a high school athlete, I, you know, we barely had an athletic trainer, like someone who would wrap an ankle, um, let alone did we have, we didn't have any kind of mental health resources. Um, and when I went to college, I suddenly went from, a, you know, public high school, which is good public high school with none of those resources to Stanford, where I had kind of any, every resource I could ever dream of, and I didn't know how to use them. Um, and I kind of wish that, you know, in track and field in particular, either USA track and field could provide some sort of um, additional like backing or training for coaches, uh, mental health resources for athletes, perhaps I grew up in California. Um, so CIF California Interscholastic Federation, um, maybe that's a role that they could take on um, in creating kind of mental health resources or further resources for coaches. Um, I know something my high school coach started to do in the last few years was start to attend seminars and that became more of kind of a regular thing, but um, amping those up virtually. I mean, I know in general, maybe this is going off topic a tad, but um, it's really difficult for athletes to transition out of sport. <laughs> and I wish that there was more like resource in general. It was something that I worked actually for a period of time for Stanford athletics. And it was something that we thought a lot about of like, how do we help create, um, identity outside of sport for athletes and because when they lose their sport, which, you know, 95% of people, even at Stanford at division one level, like are not going to go professional and how do they identify who they are kind of outside of sport and like find their happiness outside. So, um, yeah, I just think so much more could be done from like both the university level, but also for high school students from like the, um, governing body of sport, um, perhaps at the national level or even state by state. Thank you. Um, I want to ask a final question to everybody. Um, and this comes a specific question from Tony who is directing 
um, a program called You Matter in the Global Human Rights and Wellbeing. Um, he says, we have found a major protective factor against mental ill health is feeling you matter. And this has three parts to it, feeling significant, feeling appreciated, and feeling connected. So what are your views on this and how would you suggest every athlete every day feels that they matter? I love this question. So I think for me, what I see with athletes is there's a lot of like conditionality in mattering. So it's like, I will matter if X, Y, and Z, or I am not enough today. And so I, what I love when I talk with my athletes is, is like getting around that framework of, I am always enough, no matter what. And so it's that, that, that mattering as a human is not conditional. It's, it's just like, you know, we matter because we are here, because we are going through these challenges, because we are striving each day to be athletes. Um, and that's not, you know, that mattering is not conditional on an outcome. Um, and I think for athletes, like it's something that's so challenging to wrap their heads around. And I know even me, like I communicate that as a coach, yet it's still my own biggest challenge. And it's something that's been interesting for me. Yeah, I think unfortunately mattering can be tied so much to results <laughs> and like I'm in a sport in which it's all about numbers and results, um, but something that coaches I've had over the, you know, high school all the way to professional level um, have done is kind of recognize um, the worth of something that someone has done outside of like specifically a time <laughs> or how they've competed, um, recognizing like you know, a great practice they had or like a great improvement, something I, going back to my high school coach again, he used to do was the people who had like the biggest improvements year to year he'd highlight and they weren't necessarily the fastest people. And so I think giving credit or highlighting kind of perhaps slightly outside of sport or not specifically result oriented, great things um, that athletes have done make, make you feel like it's not all just about the results. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just to endorse both both Megan and Rebecca's points there. I mean, to add, you know, how often as coaches or as team managers do we ask, particularly young people, how are you feeling? How do you feel today? Do, do we provide space in our sessions for those conversations, or is it, you know, come on, it's it's seven o'clock, the whistle goes, and bang, you into you into your first drills. And I think there's something in this about just showing that that human level of, of engagement beyond the sports context, but in the sports context, having meaningful, authentic conversations between, between the athletes and those that are around them in that setting. I think that goes a very long way to, to, to helping our, our, our athletes feel valued and that people are interested in, A, how I'm feeling, and then B, when I've told them, it's not just a flippant, you know, passing conversation it matters to, to them they might change the session they might give me an easy easier day today in terms of intensity of training or i might be feeling great so so they respond and, and change it up so i think that that's important but i would also say that over time and sport is a wonderful context for, for the building of longer term relationships between all of the actors in in the space and, and over time all of those transitions the ups the downs the highs and the lows whether, whether you go through 10 years of being in a team and you win three games or, that, or you get nowhere near the, the times that you think you're capable of, you know, if that's the only way we might measure success, as Rebecca said, the results thing, you know, thinking about the process, including the highs and the lows and, and unpacking those, those feelings around those times. And I'm a terribly sore loser, awful, awful loser and, and would beat myself up. And, uh, and we used to lose quite a lot of time to some of the teams I, I was part of. But, but when you look back, and I was too hard on myself, probably, on, on those around me. And we, in those days, didn't talk about it, didn't, didn't unpack all of that and, and think about the other values that we, we all, all have um, as, as teammates, as allies, as supporters, you know, on and off the field. And I think sport you know, has all of those things going for it. And I think we could make more of that um, as, a, as a sporting community. Yeah, so I, I think that um, everybody's answer is kind of, I'm going to maybe echo a little bit of what, what everyone has said. I think one of the principles that I have that I believe firmly in is, you know, empowered people empower others. And so, you know, it, as, as, as we sort of feel and engage in these practices ourselves of feeling like we matter and, and we can easily 
within the, the light that we give off and within the words that we say to others can sort of instill that into, into other people. So I think it starts with us on an individual level first and foremost. I think one of the things that I, I really appreciated was making sure that we are being very thoughtful about our lives outside of sport because you know we are never gonna change the fact that sport is, all sports are very outcome driven. Uh, whether it's on a team and you win or lose or whether you're on a team and it's your stats or whether you're an individual athlete, it's always going to be tied to that. And the work of sports psychologists is that we kind of try and help people to undo that a little bit so that they can focus on the, the process. Uh, but, but I think we're, we're, it's an, a constant uphill battle. Uh, and so the, the best we can do is obviously try to help folks do that, but to also really engage in the person first, right? And, and really kind of make sure that we are highlighting that beyond an athlete and before you were an athlete, you were a person um, and really kind of speaking to the values of that person. One of the things that we do at the NFLPA is that we, we do an athlete and campaign. It's, it's, it's one of our bigger campaigns. And so, you know, athlete and husband, athlete and father, athlete and entrepreneur, uh, just to make sure that we are reinforcing the message that you are, you are both and, you are an NFL player and you are something else which can aid in the transition out of the game too. So kind of to address uh, Rebecca's point. So I, you know, I, again, it's sort of a multi-pronged answer. It's hard work and it's not, it's not easy because like I said, the, the culture of sport is one in which your, your identity and who you are and your self-worth is tied very much to outcomes. Um, you know, and, and so we have to kind of work at that, but if we do it ourselves, I think we are better able to kind of communicate that and relay that to the people that we're working with. I really want to thank all of you for sharing your insight, your wisdom, your experience. This has been a very great uh, conversation around a very important topic. And so I really want to thank you all and thank you for joining us. I want to pass it off to Kendall once again as we are closing out the session. Yes, I'm going to echo uh, Stacy and also Big thanks to Stacy, our guest host. Uh, thank you, panel. We really appreciate your time and expertise. Absolutely wonderful. So um, at this time, we ask our attendees to just hold on. We've got a few more uh, information points, but to our panel and our guest host, if you need to jump into your next uh, schedule, uh, please do, and thank you again.